Therefore, when the light circulates, the powers of the whole body arrange themselves before its throne. Just as when a holy king has taken possession of the capital and has laid down the fundamental rules of order, all the states approach with tribute. Or, just as when the master is quiet and calm, the men servants and maids obey his orders of their own accord, and each does his work. I read this same verse last time, but then I got into a rant <laughs> about competitive advantage and how we're going to uh, completely transform the spiritual scene with this new technology, the secret of the golden flower. So the question is, how can we do that? You know, why does it work? so well? How is it that it can be so efficient and so fast? Well, the answer is in this verse. When the light circulates, the energies of the whole body appear before its throne. Huh? We're putting the king on the throne. The energies automatically bow before the king. And they, they go on to do their jobs. Hmm? The men, servants, and maids obey his orders of their own accord. How is this? Well, most people are a chaos. The king is out of town, out of the country. The boss is not in his office, huh? When the cat's away, the mice will play. And boy, do they ever. So in most people, you have a constant conflict of one ego, one personality, one desire against another. A chaos, and they're all trying to be the, the king. But desires and thoughts and egos and all that can never be kings. Why? because they are naturally dependent. They are conditioned arisings. Without the uh, specific cause of their arising, they're impotent. They can't do anything. And what is that cause? Your energy, your life energy, chi, prana, ki, whatever you want to call it, ilan. So many different words down through history. The Chinese, the Taoists use the water, the water of life. So they also talk about the valley spirit. And what is the valley spirit? It's the same thing, the same square inch field in the square foot house. When the energy resides, in the square inch, then all the other things, all the other elements of the human being automatically surrender. No struggle, no battle, no strategy, no fighting, no discipline, no rules necessary. It happens automatically by nature. Try to understand Nature already includes the basis of self-realization, of enlightenment. Otherwise, it couldn't happen. And what's the problem with us? The king has abdicated the throne. Awareness has surrendered to mind. And like somebody couch surfing, watching the boob tube. <laughs> Whatever the mind puts up, they, they just accept. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's real. That's illusion. 
That's unenlightenment. Uh, that is the state of being that the Buddha called the putujana. Putujana is a really, <laughs> how can I say, it's so insulting. It means one who is asleep, walking around in a dream, sleepwalking through the day. Why is that? Well, you think you're awake, but you're not really awake. When you get this energy in the proper place, flowing into, into the mind, not out into the world, turn the energy around, backwards flowing motion. Once that backwards flow is established, the awareness takes its seat on the throne. And when that happens, everything else falls into harmony automatically. It's so easy, it's so simple. Last night, I had a wonderful experience. I was talking, chatting uh, with one of my long-term friends and students. And we've been chatting, you know, for well over a year now. And he said, you know, it's been a long time since I experienced happiness. I said, happiness? That's easy. And he said, come on, you know. <laughs> I've tried everything. And I, you know, just in the last couple of years, I haven't felt any real happiness. I felt really compassionate toward him. I said, look, it's really easy. Simply contemplate with your awareness the nature of awareness itself. Let your awareness contemplate its own nature. It's so easy to say, right? But he found it difficult to do. Even though he's been meditating, he's been doing Anapanasati, Buddhist meditation for some time now. Still, he found it difficult to simply let awareness contemplate its own nature. So, if you investigate consciousness with consciousness, if you become aware of your awareness, it's just like that technique that I talked about a couple episodes ago, where you look in the mirror, look at yourself in the mirror, and instead of thinking, I am looking at my reflection, think, the reflection is looking at me. See, that's what I do when I do these recordings. I put, I put the camera up there with the monitor screen turned around so I can see it. That's why maybe it looks like I'm looking off a little bit to the side, I'm not looking directly at you. Because what? I'm allowing the flow to come back. And when I do that, I automatically feel blissful and like everything's all right. It's something I learned a long time ago. So all you have to do is contemplate with your awareness, your own awareness. See, it's a feedback loop, isn't it? How does an amplifier work? An amplifier simply takes the output of a gain stage and feeds it back into the input. You have to be careful. If you, if you do too much feedback, then it goes you know, into ringing, oscillation. But if you do just enough feedback, what happens is the amplitude of the output jumps. So, what we're doing here is a similar thing where we're feeding back awareness into itself. Now think about it. What happens? It's going to amplify the awareness. It's going to increase your consciousness, which is the same as saying, Waking up. So when you wake up, what happens? You feel great. You feel happy. Because you realize, I am pure awareness. I am unconditioned consciousness. And that is your real being. That is your real nature. When you realize your real nature, 
everything falls into line all by itself. It doesn't require years of study. It doesn't require decades of practice. It doesn't require renouncing everything and going to the forest. You can do it anywhere, anytime. So easy, so simple. It's so simple, almost nobody can do it. Pathetic, isn't it? Because we're used to mind. We're used to reflecting everything in the mirror of the mind. But of course, the, the mind is a funhouse mirror. <laughs> it's not accurate. It's not objective. The mind is warped by desire. Like the existentialist Heidegger says, mind is always ahead of itself. Always already ahead of itself. In other words, you can't even find a time when the mind began to get ahead of itself. Because the nature of mind is to be ahead of itself, to be reaching towards some kind of a future that doesn't exist. Huh? Let's say I want something. I want a cup of tea. That means I don't have one. I don't have a cup of tea in the present. So we're saying what does not exist in the present, I want to exist in the future. But the problem is future never comes. So what happens is mind is a tension. Mind is a, a stress. This is the source of stress. This is the source of tension. This desire is always looking into the future. And remember, the future doesn't exist and it never comes. So even if, through some miracle, I get a cup of tea, here's my cup of tea, then I want something else. Huh? Why? Because the mind has to create this desire, this future. The mind has to be out of the present, has to be looking towards something non-existent in order to be, in order to become. See, the whole idea of becoming is that now I'm one thing and in the future I'm going to be something else, isn't it? You don't need this. In fact, it's a source of tremendous suffering. So drop it. Instead, simply observe your awareness. What is your awareness doing? You have awareness at all times. Awareness is the one thing you can't turn off. You're always aware. You're going to say, well, what about at night when you're asleep? Even then you're aware. But you're aware of dreams. Or you're aware of deep sleep, shushupta, in which there is no consciousness. See, consciousness is awareness of something. Consciousness is when Awareness becomes divided into subject and object. The Buddha says, go beyond consciousness. Go beyond this subject-object duality. Non-dual. What does non-dual mean? It means we don't divide into subject and object. So we can't say that non-duality is oneness. Because who is aware of the oneness? Duh. No. Actual oneness means nothingness. It means neither awareness nor unawareness. Perception nor non-perception. When you get to that stage, then you're just a jump away from Nibbana. And what is Nibbana? Simply awareness being aware of itself. Try it. Try it. Use the mirror trick. Look at your reflection in the mirror and think, oh, the reflection is looking at me. Or look at someone's picture. Or if you're really brave, sit across from someone and have them look at you and think, oh, they are looking at me. Something will happen when you get it. Huh? Drop me a line, let me know. <laughs> A lot of people become frightened. 
strange to say, but a lot of people will start to freak out when they start to see themselves, their, the mirror reflection looking at them. It's like, ah, uh, why? Because your whole life you have been conditioned to direct consciousness out through the senses. And when you get this backwards flowing movement of energy, it's as if that whole thing is upset, broken, finished. That conditioning is deleted from your programming. Now what? Well, awareness being aware of itself is our natural state. In fact, it gives a feeling of wonder, of discovery, like, wow, I never realized that before. I, I never saw it like that before. Huh? You do this exercise a little bit, and then you go out and look, the trees are greener, the sky is bluer, the sun is brighter, everybody looks beautiful. <laughs> you have. <laughs> Why is that? Simply because you're being aware of awareness, and awareness is what you really are. It's all you really are. All this other stuff is just the container, the context. And remember, the meaning of something is determined by the context. So if we put our awareness into the mind, the mind determines the meaning and role of awareness. And of course, the mind is going to put itself on the throne and make awareness bow down to it. And this is what's going on. This is why we suffer. This is why we make mistakes, why we fall down. So to reverse the flow means to put awareness on the throne, to make awareness the master. And when we do this, it's like magic. Everything falls into place. You suddenly realize, oh, that's why X and Y and Z happened. That's how come this and that, and blah, 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 blah. And you may even get caught up in all the realizations and lose the thread. That's okay. Take a deep breath, try it again. Go for a walk and be aware of your awareness looking at the things you see on your walk. It's so easy, it's so simple. Enlightenment is dead simple. That's why, that's why it's such a cheating business for these different spiritual paths and masters and everything to give all these complicated explanations. Why? Because they're trying to adjust the mind. Huh? They're trying to become enlightened without giving up the mind. You can't do it. It's not possible. The mind is why we're not enlightened. Because we put the mind on the throne, because we let the mind be the boss, because we let the mind be king, and the mind is not one. The mind is a crowd. So when we do this, we suddenly find ourselves overwhelmed by all of these different considerations and different conflicting points of view and all oh, conflicting desires and oh, it's just horrible. So to stop all that, just do this simple exercise, reverse the flow. Of course, we can, we can and we will make more of it, but this principle is the basic, fundamental principle of enlightenment.